Hello everybody, Ron Wildman in for Jack Ellis on the Middle Georgia Spotlight Program. We have a special guest today, the Dean of the Mercer Law School, is that what we call it? That's right. All right. Uh, Kathy Cox, and that's with a C, is that right? The right, Kathy, with a C. <laughs> I remember those days. So do I. The, uh, uh, we had a, well, she was the superintendent of the schools, but she's also in the legislature, and well, you were Secretary of State, I think, and that had to create a lot of confusion sometimes. Yes, I always reminded her that I was the original Kathy Cox, and I was older and elected first, so I had a little priority. But I was Kathy with a C, she was Kathy with a K. You know, in politics, identity is the key to everything, and to have that, to deal with that. What happened if you both had a C or a K? It you would have been even, I don't know that it could have been worse, but it probably, probably would have been, been worse. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I want to... Uh, but you ran for governor in 2006. That's right. And I look back over those years and remembered uh, a lot of things. And it seemed to me you were the most qualified person running that year. You felt that too, didn't you? <laughs> well, obviously I felt that, but the voters made other choices. Well, there's a lot involved in a campaign, a lot more than just uh, uh, images and, and everything, a lot more involved. But uh, you... Uh, when you were Secretary of State, there were several innovations you put into the office, and they're still in, in effect. One, us in here making the, uh, the facility over there by the Coliseum. Tell us about that. That's right. This, the Georgia Secretary of State's office is really one of the most diverse Secretaries of State offices in the country. It has more responsibilities than most offices. Um, and one of those responsibilities was managing professional licenses for about 200 different occupations and professions, everything that ranged from nursing to plumbing to now building contractors and everything in between. So when I was Secretary of State, the, those offices were in a building about a block down from the state capitol, and the state decided to sell the building, so I had to move the offices which gave me an opportunity to look around the state. And at the time, uh, Mayor Jim Marshall and I talked about the building opportunity here in Macon opposite the Coliseum. And so I decided to move something out of Atlanta. Uh, I thought it was a great opportunity for something like professional licensing because of people from all over the state often had to come to that building to take examinations to get licensed. So why require them to go into downtown Atlanta traffic when they're already nervous about a test, put it in the middle of the state? So we worked out sort of a lease arrangement with the city of Macon at the time and moved all of those uh, offices and a number of jobs here uh, to Macon. And that office has thrived now in Macon for well over a, a decade and a half. You're a native of Bainbridge, which is way down there. And that probably added to your... Uh, uh, judgment to do something like this. There's a lot of state outside of Atlanta. Well, it did. And while I was a member of the legislature, I had served on a, a task force, a study committee that talked about the decentralization of state government. And we had actually put into the law a requirement that any time a state agency moved an office, that they ought to consider moving things out of Atlanta, consider the cost per square footage of leasing space, consider the job opportunities that could be moved around the state. And I felt like that opportunity was a classic case to show the world that a lot of other jobs could operate outside of the shadow of the Capitol. And we've seen other agencies now just up the road in Forsyth, the old Tift, Cam Tift College campus now houses a number of state offices for the Department of Corrections and other offices. So we've shown the state can do a lot of things outside of Atlanta without missing a beat. Technology, of course, has helped that, but the office here in Macon, I've been very proud of. And economically, it probably costs a lot less to be down here. Than absolutely, there. absolutely. And of course, the Forestry Commission has been here for years. That's right. All right. Well, after uh, your, uh, 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 the governor's race, you, uh, you you lost in the primary, didn't you? That's correct. Well, that was, uh, who was it? Uh, to Mark Taylor, oh, the lieutenant governor at Mark's the time. Mark's a mess, isn't he? He is. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a political term, I guess, a mess, <laughs> but Mark, I know Mark. Uh, then you uh, became president at uh, Young Harris College. That's right. Tell us about that a little bit, because that's a long way from Bainbridge. 
It is, uh, my mother used to say I had found the opposite end of the state from Bainbridge when I moved to Young Harris. Um, and I had never anticipated going into higher education. Uh, it was probably the furthest thing on my mind after that election. But one of the trustees of Young Harris, the late Bert Lance, um, who Bert. many remember was the yeah. director of OPB in President Jimmy Carter's administration. Uh, I had gotten to know Bert during uh, the years that I was in politics. And his father had been a president of Young Harris College when he was a child. So Bert called me one day out of the blue and said, we're looking for a new president. Would you be interested? And I, I remember the call vividly because I thought he surely must have the wrong number. Uh, I said, you know, I have a JD, a Juris Doctorate degree. I don't have a PhD. And he paused and he said, well, you have a D, so we want to talk to you. And uh, I gave it a little thought and uh, put my name in the hat. And um, for reasons I often kidded the trustees at the college about, I'm not sure why they gave me the chance because I did not have experience in higher education at the time, but they hired me as the president. I knew at the time they were very interested in expanding the college from two years to four years. So I jumped into this major project to really transform the campus uh, in 2007 and had a wonderful 10 years really growing the college uh, into a great liberal arts four-year degree institution. That's a wonderful area up there, too. It's beautiful. Yeah. The uh, Young Harris uh, experience, what did you like in particular about uh, being there? Well, I, I love the opportunity to implement a lot of change on a very historic campus. Um, Young Harris College was founded in the late 1800s, was originally a four-year college, but pretty soon thereafter had converted to a two-year college, and most people knew it as a two-year college. Zell Miller, of course, was one of our most prominent graduates and almost never gave a speech during his years in politics without giving some kind of credit to Young Harris College. So I knew a lot about Young Harris as a two-year college, but I got the chance to really reshape this campus into a, an even stronger four-year college. During the time that I was there, we more than doubled the enrollment. We more than doubled the size of the faculty. We built uh, more than $100 million in new facilities. It was a whirlwind time of change on the campus, and, and I found that I really liked managing change and working with the faculty and staff to implement great ideas and to work with students on what really makes for a great college education, and that's, uh, that's an exciting t opportunity. I think you get a closeness to students up there where oh, you, you might really not get do. someplace else. You really do. Of course, we, uh, as serving as president, I lived on the campus, so I walked to work every day. Uh, I was a part of everything on campus, so I really did get to know students very well, very closely, and, and that by far was the best part of the experience of getting to know so many students so well and help them pursue their dreams. Now for the past year and a half, you've been in Macon. Again, you, you graduated from here. I did. And uh, how, how long ago was that? It was a long time ago. Oh. I was a law school graduate back in 1986. My goodness. Doesn't seem so long ago, really. <laughs> but it is, as you say. It is. What brought you to Macon? What, what prompted you to leave uh, heaven up there at the Young Harris? Well, a, a lot of people ask, and I wasn't looking to leave. Um, as I've often joked, the, the law school was looking for a dean, and uh, Daisy Floyd want, had been the dean and wanted to go back to full-time faculty work, and I'm grateful that she has stayed on the faculty. But um, they, they first approached me, and I said, no, I'm very happy here. I don't want to leave. But then they proceeded to sick every federal judge that ever went to Mercer Law School on me. So when federal judges start calling you, you pretty much pay attention. But um, some of my really most uh, favored and well-respected alumni of the college, Judge Mark Treadwell here in Macon, Judge Lewis Sands in Albany, uh, started contacting me to ask me to consider the deanship. And so I, I had to do some soul searching about whether it would be the right time to leave Young Harris. And, uh, and I had to think about... Uh, whether I had accomplished most of the big goals I had set for Young Harris, whether it was time to close the door on that opportunity and let a new leader take over there, and, and knowing how much I loved Mercer Law School, could I accomplish some good things here? So all of those things just kind of came together at the right time, and, 
they gave me the chance to uh, to come back home in, in a way. Now, when you uh, went to Young Harris, you had a lot of area where you could improve on and grow, which you did. Uh, is it the same situation here, in a way, or not? In a way, the, the thing that I found here, which was not unlike what has happened to law schools all over the country, the recession hit law schools very hard, uh, and Mercer was no different because legal jobs uh, were eliminated in a lot of places all over the country during the recession. Law firms quit hiring a lot of lawyers or froze jobs, and so as students saw the lack of job opportunities during the recession, they quit going to law school, and applications to law school dropped about 40% nationally during the recession, and Mercer felt that in very much the same way that all the other law schools in Georgia and across the country felt. So I knew coming in that Mercer had experienced a slump in enrollment. I'm happy to say today that we've had a nice uptick in enrollment, and I think coming out of the recession, the economy has improved. Law firms are hiring a little bit more now. Um, not that all of those jobs are going to come back. Some people might say that's a good thing, that uh, maybe we don't need all of the lawyers that we had in the past. Technology has come into the law practice. So there are a lot of new challenges for lawyers that I'm excited we get to figure out sort of the new normal for legal education and for law practice and how do those things mesh. Well, a law degree doesn't mean you have to be a lawyer. That's right. I mean, it opens doors to huge amount of uh, businesses and uh, everything. It, I mean, it's kind of a license to really go everywhere. You're so right. I, I call it the most flexible graduate degree that you can get because in its essence, a law degree is a degree in critical thinking and problem solving. And that's why lawyers can work in so many different areas. Yes, you can be a traditional courtroom lawyer like you might see on TV, and many students still go to law school with that version in their mind, but businesses hire lawyers because they want a lawyer maybe in-house both to solve problems they have and to prevent problems. Um, lots of, of different areas of business and industry now have new regulations and requirements for compliance with the law. And so they want lawyers on staff to work in compliance areas or risk management areas that have really grown a lot over the last decade or two. And lawyers are, are probably perfect people to hold those kind of job opportunities. So there are a lot of new places that lawyers can uh, work in business and industry and in different career settings because in essence, they're solving problems for people and for businesses. So there's just uh, almost an infinite number of areas that you can put a legal education to work. I've known uh, several young uh, attorneys who just got out of school. It seems like their careers just take off. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the other part of it. You can go to work for an employer, but lawyers can hang out their own shingle and work for themselves. Uh, because we always are there to represent individuals who have problems, whether it's a civil or a criminal problem. There's always going to be a need for that in our justice system in America. But there are always going to be other opportunities in different business settings where lawyers can find great career opportunities. Do you see many going into legal aid situations where they're really helping people that can't help themselves. Yes, absolutely. And that's why I think uh, Mercer Law School has probably always attracted uh, an unusually high number of students who do care about other people. And so we have a large number of our alumni who go into public interest and public service type of jobs. That can range from going into service with Georgia Legal Services or being a public defender in our criminal justice system. It can go into being a prosecutor, a district attorney, or a judge in the judicial system. Uh, it can be working for nonprofit organizations um, that serve and protect the environment or work on different social justice causes. 
uh, there's just so many different areas that lawyers can go and that our students want to go and put their education to work. Where do your students uh, come from? Where are their hometowns when they come here? Our students are still uh, largely coming from the state of Georgia. I would say typically 75 to 80 percent of our students come from throughout the state of Georgia. Uh, a large number of them, just by virtue of who Georgia is, come from the metro Atlanta area. But I think more so than maybe the other law schools in the state, we attract a number of students who come from small towns in Georgia, just like I did from Bainbridge, Georgia. And they want to go back to their hometowns. And when they do go back to their hometowns, they are well prepared to become the leaders in those small towns. They often get elected to city councils. They become the mayors. They get elected to school boards. They want to serve in those public offices. And they're well educated and prepared to be leaders who can serve their communities very well. Are you set up for people like this? Students we like are, this? and I, I'm excited because of my public service background to try to, to educate students to do that in a different way. In fact, during our winter break, I'm going to be teaching a course in election law so I can help students know a little bit more about how either to consult with candidates or with local election boards on how to properly run elections in Georgia, or maybe some of them will become candidates and know a little bit more about running their own campaigns. You're talking about the elections that you set up our first modern uh, voting system. I did. That, that came as a result of all the problems that we, uh, many of, of our listeners today might remember in the 2000 presidential election when the world focused on the state of Florida and the hanging chads that were being recounted. Well, when that happened, I was serving as Secretary of State, and so I was very nervous about what might have happened in Georgia, and so we did a big study and found out that we lost almost 95,000 votes in Georgia because at the time, every county in Georgia had their own voting equipment. Mm -hmm. Every county could do whatever they wanted to do, and we had a real mess on our hands in 2000. And so as a result of that, we implemented the 21st Century Voting Commission, studied the landscape of what was available, and that's when Georgia first decided to have a uniform system of voting for all of the counties, and we first implemented the touchscreen voting system that we're using today. So when you touch the vote, what happens then? Where does it go? Where, where does my vote go? Your vote goes into a memory card, which is in each individual machine in the precinct. It's never sent over the Internet. That's a, that's a misconception that a lot of people have about the hacking ability of the machines. Each unit is self-contained. It's not even connected to the other units in a polling place. It just has a memory card in that individual machine. And where does it go then? At the end of the day, every polling place, when they close down, they tabulate the memory cards from each one of those machines. They run different tapes from those machines. In fact, they post those on the door of a polling place, and then they wrap another tape around that memory card, and have to two people have to physically transport that to the central office of a county to be run through a server, and that becomes the official vote. And those memory cards are literally driven to the Secretary of State's office after a vote totals are certified to become the official statewide vote. So the office in Atlanta doesn't gather these votes and report them out? They do have an election night reporting system, and that's an unofficial vote tally. That's what a lot of people will go on the Internet on election night to see vote totals. Those are sent in by the counties to the Secretary of State's office, but that's not the official vote total. That comes from those physical memory cards, which literally get driven by car, the old-fashioned way, to the Secretary of State's office for the official certification of votes. Well, what's the next step in our uh, uh, election process here as far as machines and things? Are we ready to do something we are. We are ready, and, and uh, uh, that is being studied as we speak. In fact, there was a hearing in Macon very recently um, when Brian Kemp was serving as Secretary of State. He started another study commission, just like I had done in 2001, to decide what should we do next, because the machines we're using now are almost 16 years old. And so that is getting a lot of age on a piece of technology. Those memory cards 
are hard to, to find anymore. So it's time for Georgia to upgrade to the new next step of technology. So that commission will make recommendations to the legislature probably in the next month or two on where they believe Georgia should go next. I don't know if you're on top of it like this, but uh, what is next? I mean, what, what do you see next? For well, there, there are different, different opinions on where we should go next. When we put in the current voting machine, there was not an opportunity to have what people call a paper trail, a paper copy of the ballot in addition to the electronic memory card. Now I think there are types of voting equipment that do provide you with some paper form of the ballot in addition to the technology. And so I think that would be a good kind of an audit mechanism for us to have so that you always have that additional check and balance. And so I think if that's available, that would be a really good addition to give people extra confidence in the voting system. But you don't want to have, you don't want to go back to the pure paper ballots that we used to have in Georgia that generated a lot of opportunities for fraud and for voter error. Um, so that's where, when I spoke to this commission when they were here in Macon um, a week or two ago, I cautioned them to remember the fraud and errors we used to have and to remember the voters who have disabilities, um, whether it's a visual disability, um, they can't see a ballot, they may be completely blind. We've been able to cure a lot of those problems with the technology we have and if we go back to pure paper ballots then we disenfranchise a lot of voters that have been able to vote independently. So we have to consider a lot of uh, complex things whenever you change a voting system. Well, the actual voting is one thing, but uh, there's several other processes. Uh, registration, for instance. Do we do that right, or can that be better, how we handle that? Well, there are states that do uh, different ways of voter registration. There are states that have same-day voter registration. We have a requirement where you have to register 30 days in advance of elections, but there are some states that say you can just show up and register on election day. That doesn't sound uh, too good. It, well, what is it? it? It would require some additional technology to make sure that somebody couldn't register more than one place. But there are states we could benefit from studying the states who have been doing it for a while to see how that works, to see if it helps voting. Seems like you could bus in a bunch of folks or however you well, want. Well, that's why I say, you know, there are states who've done it successfully, really? so we could study their experience. Uh, but for the most part, I think our registration system has worked pretty well. Uh, whether we have the best technology for it is something that I think this current commission could study. Um, so that's a piece of the process. But as many of our listeners may remember from this recent election cycle, we had some issues in the polling places where poll workers were not maybe adequately trained on how to handle provisional ballots, which is the, you know, the paper ballot you're given if for some reason your name is not on the voter list or there's some problem with your registration. We don't want to turn a voter away. You get a provisional ballot and then any, um, any defect with your registration can be cured in the days after the election so your vote could be counted. But a lot of poll workers didn't know how to handle provisional battle, ballots. We had some problems with, vote, with uh, counties not handling absentee ballots in the same way. We still, in this day of identity fraud, still require people who mail in an absentee ballot, we require them to put a lot of personal information on the outside of an envelope, like your date of birth. Well, who wants to put your date of birth on the outside of an envelope today? That can be used for identity fraud. So I think a lot of voters just did not put that on the envelope, and their vote got booted out. Well, that's one of those little things yes. that, oh, I see. So see, that's an easy fix that the legislature needs to address and think about all of the things that complaints that were raised during the election. There are some pending lawsuits about some of these processes that are going to play out. But the legislature has a really good opportunity to make sure that these things, and the new Secretary of State, to make sure that things are handled consistently on the county level and that we do get things fixed and handled in the right way going forward. I want to get back on Mercer, which is why we're here, but the Secretary of State, uh, Brian Kemp, 
he stayed on the job throughout the campaign. Uh, how did you feel about that? Well, you know, the Secretary of State is an elected office by, by the Constitution of Georgia. It is an elected office. And so it has, as I mentioned earlier, it has a lot of additional responsibilities besides elections. Sure, sure. So I don't know that it's really fair to require the Secretary of State to resign when they have all these other responsibilities. The way that I handled it when I was running for governor was that I recused myself from chairing the election board, the state election board, so that I would not be in the middle of all of the election investigations, that I would not be privy yeah. to election information, and I let other people in the office manage that. That's the way that I chose to handle it. So I could still carry out the other functions of the office that were unrelated to elections. I think the legislature may want to address that and figure out so that it's not an ongoing complaint, because even if the Secretary of State were just running for re-election, his or her opponent might still think there was something untoward about the, the secretary staying in office and running his or her own re-election campaign. Well, if you look at recent history, it seems like our secretary of states are running for governor. It's a great office to prepare you for that because the responsibilities. What percentage of uh, that job is involved with the elections and then everything else? Well, it, it always depends on the time of year because obviously elections uh, are oh, seasonal yeah. Yeah, yeah. and don't happen all the time. But I would say in the grand scheme of things, elections could be 40 to 50 percent of the job. And what are some of the other jobs involved in that? Well, we mentioned professional licensing, but the um, business community certainly knows that the Secretary of State's office manages the corporation section. Yeah. So any business entity that's formed into an LLC or a corporation has to go through the Secretary of State's office. It's what we call a ministerial act. It's an administrative act, but it's a very important function for business and legal community to interact with the office through that part of the office. There are also uh, portions that deal with securities regulation, the investment industry, um, there are things that people don't even know. The Secretary of State is the professional boxing commissioner. So you'd be surprised. <laughs> How has this uh, helped you to be the dean of the law school and to deal with these students Well, and their futures? It, it, because it put me in the Secretary of State's office into a lot of different areas that intersected with business and industry and people from all walks of life, I think it gives me a, uh, makes me a little more well-versed in talking to our law students about opportunities that they have for practice, opportunities that they have for using their legal education, and it just uh, sort of helps me have a better feel for the needs and the demands of legal knowledge around the state of Georgia. Well, believe it or not, we have less than a minute. This went fast. Thank you. You were a reporter at one time. I sure was. That was my first job. Did you enjoy that? I loved being a journalist and a reporter. I and sure it helped did. you with the media because you were always accessible when you were well, in thank office. You. And thank you. At least I think I was not afraid of the media having been on that other side of the notepad. Well, thank you for being with us. Thank and, you very uh, much. Continued success with uh, everything. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Well, thank you for joining us today. For Mary Ellis, I'm Ron Wildman here at WMUB, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.